Welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab. This is a complete course for the CCNP NCORE, Enterprise Core exam. This course will cover all topics you need to know to pass the NCORE exam. In this video, we will look at distributed Ceph, as well as the related centralized Ceph. To understand centralized and distributed Ceph, you need to understand what a chassis router is. So we'll cover them and other related topics in this video. Here's what we'll cover in this video. First, we'll take a brief look at server racks. This isn't directly related to distributed Ceph, but it is related to the next topic, chassis routers. These are large routers which have many modular parts. Here's an example of a chassis router, a Cisco ASR9006 router. Finally, we'll look at centralized and distributed Ceph. The basic functions of Ceph, as we learned before, are the same. But Ceph's implementation in chassis routers is a bit different, because of the structure of chassis routers. So let's talk about server racks. Note that although the term server rack is commonly used, we don't just mount servers in them, but network devices too. However, the term server rack seems to be more common than network rack. The devices in this image are servers owned by the Wikimedia Foundation, mounted in racks in a data center. There are a few different kinds of racks. For example, some companies might mount their devices in simple two-post racks like this. Racks like this are often sufficient for smaller and lighter devices. Others might require four-post racks. Some devices might need to be attached to both the front and back posts, depending on the size and weight of the device. And for the purpose of improved physical security, it's common for the rack to be enclosed in a locked cabinet. There are other types of racks too, for example, wall-mounted racks. These are just a few examples. Now let's look at the dimensions of a rack. The most common rack width is 19 inches, or 483 millimeters. This includes the ears on each side of a device, used to mount it on the rack. Here's a Cisco switch. Notice the ears on each side. That's how you mount the device on the rack. Racks are vertically divided into rack units, RU, each one 1.75 inches in height. A full rack is typically 42 rack units or more, but racks come in various sizes. Note that you might see a rack's height or a device's height written as RU, rack units, or just U, units. A typical 1U device is slightly less than 1.75 inches in height, so it fits within the one rack unit dimensions and larger devices can take up two, three, four, or more rack units. Let's see some examples. This Cisco ASR9000V is one rack unit in height. Its height is 1.56 inches, so it fits well within one rack unit. This ASR9901 is two rack units, and its actual height is 3.47 inches, just under the size of two rack units. The ASR9006 is 10 rack units, and its height is 17.5 inches, so exactly 10 rack units. And on the extreme end of things, there's this beast, the ASR9922, which is 44 rack units. So this takes up an entire rack. Two of the devices I'm showing here are chassis routers, these two larger ones. Within the chassis, there are modular parts that can be customized depending on, for example, what kind of interfaces, and how many interfaces you need on the device. Now let's look at chassis routers in more detail. In a chassis router, modular hardware components are housed within a chassis. Modular means they can be added and removed. You can customize the device to fit your needs. And the hardware components connect to the chassis backplane, which is the circuitry within the chassis, that allows the different hardware components to communicate with each other. It connects all of the separate modular components together. And the connections between the hardware components form the switch fabric. That's the name for the web of connections between all of the components. And those connections are made via the backplane circuitry. I'll show some diagrams illustrating the switch fabric later. Let's define some of those hardware components. Note up top there is a photo of an ASR9006 router, and below, a diagram indicating the hardware components. Line cards, which I've outlined in blue in the diagram, 
provide network interfaces. For example, a line card might provide 40 1 gig Ethernet UTP interfaces. Or if you need higher speeds, perhaps it'll provide 24 10 gig interfaces, or 8 100 gig interfaces. Chassis routers are very customizable. Then, route switch processor, RSP cards, provide the brains of the device. So, control plane functions, packet switching decisions, the switch fabric that connects the other cards together, and management interfaces, console ports, etc. will be on this card. Note that the ASR9006 has six slots, four for line cards and two for RSPs. The number at the end of the model name indicates the number of slots for line cards and RSPs. By the way, you might also hear the name supervisor for the RSP cards. Here's a photo and diagram of another ASR model, the ASR9010. As the name suggests, there are 10 slots in total. The two middle ones are for RSP cards, the brains of the device, and the other eight are for line cards, which provide network interfaces. Now, some chassis routers are structured a bit differently. In some devices, the functions of the RSP cards are provided by two separate cards, as is the case with this ASR9912 I'm showing here. Route processor, RP cards, provide the control plane functions, packet switching, etc. And fabric control, FC cards, provide the switch fabric. Note that this device's name ends in 12, but that count includes only the line card slots, 10 of them, and the route processor slots, 2 of them. In addition, there are 7 slots for fabric control cards, which provide the fabric that connects the other cards together. Note that in chassis routers, the hardware components are field replaceable units, meaning they can be easily replaced on site, in the field, without having to send the device back to the manufacturer. So if one line card malfunctions, you can simply remove it and insert another one. This applies to things like the fan trays and power modules too. Note that the backplane components, however, are not FRUs. The backplane circuitry is part of the chassis itself and can't easily be removed and replaced. Here's a diagram showing the switch fabric connections between route switch processors and line cards. Here are the RSPs and the line cards. You don't need to know the detailed architecture of these chassis routers, I just want to show what the fabric looks like. If a packet arrives on an interface on one line card, and must be forwarded out of an interface on another line card, the packet will travel over the switch fabric to reach the other line card. And here's an example of a chassis router with separate route processor cards and fabric control cards. In blue, we have the line cards, providing the network interfaces for the router. In orange, the route processors, providing control plane functions among other things. Note that in this example and the previous ones, there are always two route processors for the purpose of redundancy. And in purple, there are the fabric control cards, which help connect the other components together. Okay, we've spent enough time looking at chassis routers. Now let's see how this relates to Ceph. Basically, the question is, what part of this modular system should perform Ceph forwarding? In centralized Ceph, the Ceph forwarding decisions are performed on the RP or RSP card. A packet arrives on an interface on a line card, travels through the switch fabric to the RP, which uses Ceph to decide which interface the packet should be forwarded out of. It is then sent back through the switch fabric, and out of the appropriate interface on the egress line card. Hence the name centralized Ceph. Ceph is performed centrally by the route processor card. Note that the ingress and egress line cards might be the same or different line cards. It just depends which interface receives the packet and which interface it will be sent out of. And also note that the route processor could be on its own RP card or a component of an RSP card. It depends on the architecture of the specific device. Now finally, let's look at distributed Ceph, DCEF. In DCEF, the Ceph forwarding decisions are performed on each line card. So the line cards each store a copy of the FIB and adjacency tables. 
A packet arrives on an interface on one of the line cards, which uses Ceph to decide how it should be forwarded. It travels through the switch fabric to the egress line card and is sent out of the appropriate interface. Note that if the ingress and egress line cards are the same, the packet won't be sent through the switch fabric. It will simply be forwarded out of another interface on the same line card. So distributed Ceph is called distributed because the Ceph capabilities are distributed across the router on each line card, rather than being centralized on the route processor. Note that depending on the device, it might support only centralized Ceph, only distributed Ceph, or both. Distributed Ceph is more efficient than centralized Ceph, but it also requires more advanced line cards, which are more expensive. You can expect devices supporting distributed Ceph to be more expensive than devices that only support centralized Ceph, and cost is a major factor in deciding which hardware to use. But DCEPH is the ideal because it's more efficient. Note that the command to enable DCEPH on platforms that support it is IPCEPH distributed, but it should be enabled by default if the device supports it. You can use no in front of the command if you need to disable it. Here's what we covered in this video. First, we looked at server racks used to mount server and network hardware. Then we looked at chassis routers. Note that I used the term routers throughout this video, but there are also chassis switches and firewalls too. However, since we're focusing on the layer 3 forwarding process of Ceph, I used the term router throughout this video. And the final topic was centralized and distributed Ceph. In centralized Ceph, the route processor of the chassis makes the Ceph forwarding decisions. In distributed Ceph, each line card is capable of doing Ceph on its own which is more efficient because each packet doesn't have to travel to the route processor card for forwarding. It can go straight to the egress line card. We spent more time on the first two topics than on Ceph itself, but it was important fundamental information to understand what centralized and distributed Ceph are. And we will look at chassis routers again in future videos. Now let's go to the quiz to test your understanding of these topics. Here's quiz question one. On a DCEPH enabled device, which function would you not expect to be handled by the RP? Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, the answer is C, Ceph. In decentralized Ceph, Ceph is performed by the line cards, not the route processor card. However, the RP would be responsible for control and management functions like OSPF, SSH, and BGP. Okay, let's go to question two. In some chassis routers, the functions of the RSP card may be divided among what two cards? Select two. Pause the video now to think about the answers. Okay, the answers are B, RP, and C, FC. In some chassis routers, the RSP, route switch processor cards, perform various control functions as well as providing the switch fabric connecting the cards together. In other chassis routers, those functions are divided among two types of cards, the route processor cards and fabric control cards. Generally, you can expect RSP cards to be used in smaller devices and RP and FC cards to be used in larger devices. Okay, let's go to question three. Which component of a chassis router is not an FRU? Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, the answer is B, the backplane. FRU means field replaceable unit, and it refers to components of a device that can easily be added, removed, and replaced in the field. The backplane is the circuitry on the chassis itself that connects the various cards together, and it cannot be easily replaced. Other components such as fan trays, power modules, RSP cards, line cards, etc. are FRUs and can easily be replaced if one malfunctions. Okay, that's all for the quiz and this video. I hope it was helpful. Thanks for watching. Before finishing this video, let me thank my JCNP level channel members. To become a member, please click the join button under the video.
Thanks to Yonatan Makara, Velva Jacob, George Streeter, Fanny Dart, Nasir Chowdhury, Devin Suku, Gustavo Biar, Gerard Baker, Marcel Lord, Pavel M., Mr. Erlison, Dragos Hirnea, Zakib Shah, Mayor Salman, Mazen Anderson, Vitaus194, Gina Lindley, Nahimia, Justin Watke, Mark Jackson, Bold1C1U, Michael Carroll, Gerald Guiam, Gabriel Braga, Hector Hernandez, Ali Polat, Mara Tuba, Roji Kuriakos, Arpad Konives, Five Feet, Owad, Daniel Brown, Tricky Mickey, 123456, Scott Thompson, Jose Alvarez, Kevin Hayes, Hussein Yavus, Samuel Tavares, Mustafa Ersoy, Dear Diso, Nasser Zahar, Alexandru Badic, Brian Grant, Georgi Gemajev, Ahmed Ismail, Dibya Swain, Arlen Plagaria, Adelson Pereira, Abdo Zizo, Farad69, and Lucien Stoichitoyu. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but thank you so much for your support. Thanks to you and my other supporters, I am able to make these videos and release them for free on YouTube, so I really appreciate the support. Another great way to support the channel is to like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this video with others. So if this video was helpful, I'd appreciate it if you did any of those. Thanks for watching.